All right, I'm going to start her up. Good Are you see. ready to go? Webinar is now live. A cast of thousands, no doubt, are streaming in from across the globe. <laughs> yeah. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute everyone now, except for myself. You guys can still chat with me. I'd like to know how many people are, are uh, logged in. 150 that we saw uh, wow. as of last. That's remarkable. But Dennis, if you're okay. Gonna... Hello. There's some issue I wanted to interject myself. On. How do I do that? Uh, let's see. You just hold down the space bar and you can unmute yourself. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Okay. Testing, testing. One, two. Testing. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, for whatever reason, it's just showing uh, David. I'm gonna mute you, David. Um, all right, welcome to the 2020 Cryonics Institute AGM meeting. Uh, today, we're gonna have uh, a short video for those of you who are on, uh, not used to cryonics or uh, newbies to the process. And this is gonna describe what cryonics is, a little bit about the cryonics institute itself. Uh, we have a short PowerPoint also, which will give you a tour of the Cranics Institute, our latest photographs of what, what's going on inside the building. We're going to have some speakers, uh, starting with uh, Pat Heller. He's going to um, talk about our financials. Uh, then it's going to be followed by Steve Loikes, who's going to talk about our current investments and break down some of the financials. Then we're going to have guest speaker, Dr. Mary Ruwert. Uh, she's going to talk about the libertarian perspective on cutting edge science. Um, she's a return um, speaker who uh, did a feature with us back in the 1970s. Um, we also going to have uh, Joe Kowalski, uh, who's going to talk about the cryo prize. We're going to follow that up with uh, Rudy Hoffman, who's going to talk about cryonics insurance. Then uh, David Edinger, um, son of Robert Edinger, is going to talk about some of the current progress uh, with the Cranix Institute and any legal issues. Uh, then myself, I'll talk about some of the progress as well. Some uh, standby reminders. Everyone knows that's my favorite topic and uh, very important to me. Uh, I'll read off the election results and then we can follow up with Q&A. So I'd like to ask everyone for, uh, as part of housekeeping, to not use the chat. The panelists can use chat back and forth individually, but I would like to ask all the attendees to use the Q&A after we're done, and then we, it'll be less formal, and we can uh, talk about what your questions are at that point. And then that'll be followed up by the Immortalist Societies meeting, and that will conclude our, our service at that point. <clears throat> so, uh, just a moment here while I queue up the video. Freezing. You're back now. Okay. <clears throat> Doug, where's that video? No, the other one. Oh, here it is. Sorry, everyone, bear with me just one moment. You might want to explain this the first time we've done it this way because of COVID and so on. Yeah, so this is the first time uh, we've had to go completely live um, off the internet because of the COVID situation. And uh, so since it is our first time, please uh, have a little patience and bear with us through this process. Okay, now how do I share this?
Where is it? Okay. While you're working on that, Dennis, there are all sorts of chats on there. A lot of people, my goodness. So nice to see everybody. Do you guys currently see um, the shared screen? Joe, do you see the shared screen? No, I can't hear him. No, sir. Okay. This one. They're not seeing it. I can see you, Dennis. Uh -huh. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay. Can, uh, can you just... Now, why isn't the sound working? Can you test the sound video? Because, I mean, <sighs> this doesn't work. Can, can we just send them the YouTube video? Yeah. I've been asked to uh, restart the video because they weren't getting sound. David, you're unmuted. Uh, could you hear the sound for the video? I could do that. Okay. You might want to just start with the speakers if the video is a problem. All right. I, I can come back to that. I'll skip ahead to the PowerPoint I was going to show. <clears throat> or possibly drop it in a Dropbox. Maybe somebody else can run it. It might work. I don't know. Just guessing. Let's not take everybody's time with all this chatter. Why don't we just proceed with the meeting? All right. All right, we can come back to that at the end towards the Q&A. Um, let's see, the first speaker would be uh, Pat Heller, who is going to talk about the Cranix Institute financials 
and we'll go from there. Um, Pat. Uh, I'm here. Okay. Hi, Pat. How you doing? All right. Uh, um, let me quick intro on Pat. Uh, Pat is a certified public accountant. Uh, through most of uh, though most of the part he deals with rare coins and precious metals. He's owner and chief executive of Liberty Coin Service at Lansing, Michigan. He's become treasurer of CI in 1980 and has also served as vice president of CI. He took office as vice president in the late 1995 following Andrea Font and stepped down in 2001, though he continues as director and treasurer and as a CI officer. Welcome, Pat. Oh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, at uh, the regular in-person meetings, I usually hand out uh, financial statements for the last fiscal year, which ends December 31st, and then the June 30th, in this case, 2020 financial statements, so that attendees can follow along. Uh, that's not really practical in this kind of meeting format. So after the end of this meeting, uh, these financial statements will be posted on the Cranix Institute website. Uh, and in the short time I have here, I figured it makes most sense to focus on the financial changes that occurred from the June 30th, 2019 financial statements to June 30th, 2020. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that on June 30th, 2019, the Cranix Institute had 176 human patients in storage. Uh, a year later, June 30th, 2020, we had 187. So there's an increase of 11 uh, that you need to consider is your organization growing. Uh, and total assets from the end of June, 1000, June 30, 2019 to 2020, total assets went up 124,000. But uh, total patient care assets because of the Extreme volatility and in investments were down 108,000. Uh, if you take the uh, total amount of uh, patient care assets divided by the number of human patients, and June 2019, it was a little over 25,000 per patient, and uh, June 30, 2020, it was a little over 23,000. The financial planning for the Cranix Institute all along is to have in effect an endowment of at least 20,000. So the Cranix Institute still has more than that. And that's actually the 23,000 at the end of June is still one of the higher per patient uh, figures uh, we've ever had. Uh, prepaid assets went up by 389,000. Uh, although from uh, July 1, 2019 to June 30, 2020, we only received uh, 349,000, just under 350,000 in uh, new uh, contract prepayments. Uh, since the end of June, some of these uh, extra funds that have been received in the prepayment fund, which reflects increases in investment value, uh, has been transferred to patient care. Uh, because of losses in the uh, investments from June 30, 2019 to a year later, the fund balance, you might say the book net worth of CI dropped $290,000. But when you consider that the gains and losses on investments were over 470,000 down in that year period, otherwise CI gained 180,000. Uh, Cranic services were 381,000 uh, dividend, and this is in the year. Uh, dividends 105,000, interest uh, income 63,000. Those three numbers added together exceeded total expenses of 536,000. Uh, it's only when you subtract the uh, loss over the year on the investments of 470,000 that you get a bottom line loss of $455,000. I want to put up a document here that, uh, oh, let's see. Oh, let's. Let's 
see if I can bring that in. Uh, I might not. Um, uh, I did an analysis over the past five and a half years, uh, January 1st, 2015 to June 30th, 2020, to analyze uh, income expenses and various assets. Uh, fixed assets rose from 1.1 million to 1.8 million, an average annual increase of about 150,000. The patient care assets rose an average of over $300,000 a year. Total assets rose from 4.7 million to 8.2 million. Uh, prepaid contracts rose from 1.3 to $2.5 million. Uh, contributed capital rose from 4.2 to $5.5 million. So there's been some definite growth, uh, although it tends, it has been uh, arithmetic increases as opposed to geometric, where over time the increases uh, start to increase. Uh, in the five and a half year period, the average uh, new memberships was about $133,000 but we also have some bequests that have come in uh, from patients who paid extra funds over the contract prices, averaging $130,000 a year. So despite the investments over the five and a half years showing an average small loss, uh, the assets of CI have been growing year to year. Uh, average contract prepaid in the five and a half years is over $200,000. So um, that the prepayment of contracts helps CI because the income off of that helps uh, subsidize, you might say, other expenses of CI. Uh, if anybody has questions on this, uh, you're welcome to ask them in the question and answer session that we have coming up later. And that's my presentation. Thank you, Pat. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, thanks for being uh, uh, brief with that. And I think uh, our next speaker to follow up will be uh, Steve Loikes. Steve Loikes is born in Detroit, Michigan, fifth of six children. He graduated from Michigan State in 1986 with a BA in logistics and a master's degree in finance. A few years later, his professional career includes Kraft Foods, Chrysler, Daimler, Chrysler Financial, and in 2009, became the president of a joint venture between ADP and Reynolds. He first became interested in Kranix when a neighbor friend who was an important influence in his life introduced the topic. He has been one of the longest serving board members dating back almost 20 years and has attended every annual meeting since 1988. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dennis. Uh, try to add some color here. I think it was about 25 years ago, I was in uh, David Ettinger's home and uh, I think uh, Robert or May added my name to the short list of future board members and uh, before I knew it, I was on the board and uh, I'm still there and hopefully uh, by the end of this meeting, I'll be uh, I'll be reelected and I can serve uh, for another three years or however long uh, Dennis and the rest of the team uh, think I'm adding value. So I'd like to uh, follow a pat and help translate uh, uh, the accounting speak to to layman. I'm not a CPA. I could not complete uh, what what uh, Pat does for us, but I certainly understand corporate finance and I can help explain our uh, financial situation. So I'm going to share my screen and. Uh, uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Can I share my screen? Uh, that might be in the, uh, Dennis. That might be why Pat couldn't share his screen either. But in the test run, I was able to share my screen. Uh, so, hey Doug, that might be it. Is there a setting on Dennis's uh, computer that? Uh, that is preventing us from sharing our screen. We should probably look at that. I had that issue last night when we were doing a test also and Doug was able to handle it pretty quickly. So hopefully we'll be, get this taken care of right away. Yeah. Dennis, I think you're the host, right? But I was able to share my screen before we brought everybody online.
Here, what's this here? Ah, uh, that worked. All right, I'm gonna start. Everybody should be able to see my screen here. Did that work? No. Can people see my screen yet? No. It says it's working. How about oh, now? now? There now it goes. Ah, success. Let me just make it make it a little bit larger for everybody. Can everybody can everybody see a, a bullet point in the gra in a graph? Yes. Or at least David, all right. <laughs> well, it's, well, it's like I said before, we'll add some color to this presentation. So I call this my non-accountant synopsis of our financial statement condition. Uh, but basically, you know, uh, translating what what um, Pat said, uh, and when you look at when you look at the financials later, and for those of you who have seen them in the past, really just look at the far right column. We need to separate things for accounting purposes. But the real idea is, is uh, to, to look at, at the right-hand column that really gives you a, a better picture of our financial uh, condition. But we uh, basically a very solid financial condition, uh, no, no question about that. And, and really, here's, here's all you need to know. Uh, we're actually worth more than our, than our book value. And one of the reasons is, is that landing and buildings are, are paid for and they're undervalued. So accounting rules and economic value do differ. So we're allowed to depreciate our building, not our land, but our building. So we have, uh, ironically, we have about 800,000 in our uh, the original investment in our, in our building. We've depreciated about half of that. The economic value still is, is far greater, uh, probably at least 800,000. So those, you know, so, so the land's probably appreciated. The buildings certainly haven't depreciated. We, we keep them up. Uh, and so they're, they're worth more than, more than book value. And then if you look at our, our next largest uh, item are the cryostats. Uh, these are likely to last for 50 or even 70 plus years and, and we depreciate those over seven years. And uh, that's, that's what the accounting rules allow us to do. The economic value obviously is far greater than that. So ironically, there's a, it, it, we have about 800,000 uh, into, into our cryostats uh, and, and the book value is currently 220,000. So clearly they're worth uh, far more than uh, their current book value. We have about seven million in investments, as, as, as Pat discussed, which includes about three million in prepaid. I'm just I'm just rounding here for simplicity. Uh, so, but really, there's no debts. Yes, it, you know the accounting treatment for prepaid prepaid is a debt, but there's really we have no debt in our organization. Everything's paid for. Um, you know, and, and as I said before, the economic value of CI is, is significantly greater than the 5.6 million dollar book value. Um, and, and as I look back, uh, our, our net value is about doubled over the last seven years. So we're not only, we're not only solid financially, uh, but we, can, we continue to, to march forward and, and improve our, our valuation. Okay, looking at uh, the uh, financial statement condition further, the income statement, how would, how would uh, I read and report the, on the income statement is solid and sustainable. No question about it. So if you look at uh, our, our core revenues, cranic services, as I, as I look, as I, I dig into it, you know, what's uh, we, you know, folks always ask, you know, what, what is our break even? If we were really to bring in one uh, human patient, maybe a couple pets, that's really all we need in order to break even from a cash flow perspective month, month over month. And, and, and we often do that. So if you, and so where are our expenses, the allocation of our expenses, let me build a slide here. So uh, the, uh, the, the largest single expense item is personnel at about 35%. Facilities is about another uh, 27%. Uh, and cryostats are about 15%. I put in green the uh, other expenses and the personal expenses because those are cash expenses. The other, the cryostats are typically depreciation expense. Facility is both depreciation and some, and some improvements. But we, uh, we have uh, good controls in place. We're not we're not out out, out spending uh, what, what we're bringing in. We often uh, have a, a more than more than the minimum patients there to break even month to month. Although we really don't look at it month over month. You can't really predict, you know, the type of uh, traffic you're going to have uh, from from a patient standpoint. But it, but it, it, the other the other area 
we have a, a large investment uh, pool. Uh, if, 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 we can, if that pool can return over 2%, which is obviously uh, after tax, which is a very reasonable, uh, that's, a, that's a net positive to CI. So uh, we really, we've really structured the organization very cost conservatively, efficiently, and uh, with, with just a, a, a patient or two a month, including pets, and uh, a reasonable rate of return, uh, we're, we're, set up, we're set up to be financially positive for the foreseeable future. That's what our income statement says, but you gotta look back over a few years to see that. So in uh, moving on to uh, digging a little bit deeper into the investment approach, the, uh, the investments are really divided into two uh, stratagems. So uh, one is un unmanaged indexed. This is heavily weighted towards the equity markets. Near zero cost, we use Vanguard funds. I'll show you a graph on the next slide. That's doing well as expected. We also have a managed book, Joe Kowalski, who will be speaking later. He's a full-time seasoned professional and, and a CI board member. Uh, and the plan is to reevaluate the above strategies after three-year performance period, which, re which recently occurred. The investment committee met and uh, we, we looked at it. Uh, the unmanaged funds are doing, are doing better. Uh, that's the majority of our uh, equity portfolio is, is in that, uh, is, is, is unmanaged. Uh, the new funds are going into the un, uh, unmanaged accounts and, and we'll continue to monitor quarter over quarter. Um, we, like to, we like to give uh, the, the managed book an, another year or so to see if, uh, if they can perform uh, better than the unmanaged. So Joe has, uh, has unperformed uh, uh, over the three year period. Year to date, uh, it, it has done. It has overperformed the S and P. So, uh, the uh, the committee will continue watching those funds as well. But I, I what I in addition here, um, hopefully this isn't too much of a, of micro print. I did include a couple of a couple uh, detailed investment snapshots. So some of you, uh, you know, may have seen seen these investment style boxes in in Morningstar. You can see in this in this specific portfolio. We're heavily weighted U.S. stocks and heavily weighted in, in large caps, and you can see on the right-hand side the, the industries that uh, that that uh, this large fund is in, in invested in. But more importantly, uh, looking if you can see over the time in this in this unmanaged account, we have about 3.8 million. I think I took this snapshot of about a week ago. It looks like a September 4th, uh, and the uh, annualized rate of return was about 8% over time. And you can see the growth uh, and the, the rise in the fall, the pandemic plunge, the, re the recovery uh, thereafter. And I also have, a, have highlighted there, uh, at least it looks like the uh, larger share balances that, that that fund is invested in. So obviously that, that has done well uh, with, with the market and uh, we have realized a, a, a decent rate of return. So uh, I won't go into Joe's investment methodologies. Uh, he's offered in the past to, to speak with anyone one-on-one. Uh, uh, -on -one. Uh, so there's, uh, there's his phone number if you, if, if you wish to speak to him and he'll be speaking later as well. Additional commentary. So, uh, you know, holding, holding the line on 28,000 really has been made possible by the thoughtfulness and, and the previous members who have uh, made some generous uh, request to CI. Uh, as, as Pat mentioned, uh, that, that certainly has helped us. So we, we all should be considering that when we, when we do our estate planning. That's certainly uh, put us in, in a position where we can retain you know, the $28,000 investment and have a nice uh, nest egg to invest in, 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 and live off those dividends and interest and gains. Uh, also, uh, the, the long-term and ongoing volunteer efforts, you know, David's legal advice, uh, Pat's accounting advice, you know, Dennis stepping in and, and doing so much. Joe, every you know, all of us have, have stepped up and done so much work here. Um, that that uh, you know, not not even to add all these positions to payroll has has really helped streamline our cost. And you know, if there's any other lawyers out there or marketing professionals, uh, anybody who could you know wants to volunteer their service, uh, don't hesitate to raise your hand because. Uh, we need we need to we need the succession planning on top of on top of our uh, our our collective efforts. Employee the employee costs are well controlled, uh, so yep yeah, they are they are a, a significant part of our of our pie, but uh, very very well under controlled. Solid accounting and, and audit controls, 
So the last thing we want to do is is to, to, to see anything happen uh, to to our to our funds. We feel like we have uh, we have good controls in place. We've stewarded uh, the ship quite well over the years. So that's uh, been uh, part of my responsibility too, is just to make sure that uh, we're solid and, and secure. And those are uh, those uh, are, are my planned remarks, and I'll be around to answer some questions. Dennis, take All right. Time. Thank you, Steve. Uh, if you want to remove your sharing option, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, our next speaker uh, is Joseph. I'm going to skip ahead because our guest speaker is coming. Will be coming in shortly. Uh, but I'm going to introduce uh, Joseph Kowalski. Uh, he is the CIA Assistant Secretary. Uh, Joe Kowalski was born and raised in the Detroit area. Is an Orthodox Jewish home. Both his parents are teachers. A fact he feels encourages his own lifelong love of learning. He recalls that his first he first became aware of Koranics when a seventh grade science teacher brought some Koranics material to class. Joe was hooked. For the next 15 years, Joe kept abreast of the movement, eventually becoming an associate member of the Immortal Society. Joe is also a CI officer. Uh, welcome. Hello. You do. There you go. All right. Uh, and I'm going to try and get this stuff done, also get stuff on the screen. Uh, first of all, welcome to my porch, uh, or maybe I should be a little bit more serious. Uh, welcome to my lanai where I often relax in my suit and tie, um, or not. I usually have a marshmallow roast after the meeting is over. I think this is probably about as close as we're going to get to the marshmallow roast, so welcome everybody. Uh, I always mention the cloud when I start to speak. You know, the cloud when we're talking about computers is not a cloud. Uh, you're storing your information on someone else's computer. What could possibly go wrong with that? It has nothing to do with my talk, but I like to mention it. All right, I'm going to try to share my screen. Let's see if this works. Uh, give me just a sec. Uh, here we go. And can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can, yes. Joe. All right. Sorry, I apparently got muted. Do you see my full screen or you see notes at this moment? No notes. No notes. All right, great. Then we're doing okay. Uh, I've been on the board of the Cryonics Institute for about 25 years, and I've been involved with cryonics for over 40 years. Uh, but today, I'm actually a guest speaker. I'm going to be speaking about the Organ Cryopreservation Prize, which is a project of the Immortalist Society. Uh, which is going to have its annual meeting later on today. So I do want to thank uh, everyone at the Immortalist Society, York, Debbie, everyone else for their hard work and support. And thanks also to the Cryonics Institute for allowing me to speak about this at the Cryonics Institute meeting. I'm confident that cryonics is going to work. It's just a matter of copying nature. This little wood frog here freezes at wintertime. Its brain stops, its lungs stop, its heart stops. And the amazing thing is that in the springtime, it all restarts in the proper sequence to work. Nematodes have been frozen and their memory has been retained even after they've been revived. Tardigrades, water bears, very hardy creatures. They dry out and then several months later they basically come back to life when they've been re, uh, when water has come in but they've also been frozen by Japanese scientists for 30 years and brought back fully alive they even had some kids uh, this guy was uh, drinking a little bit too much and ended up out in the snow and died out there and uh, when the paramedics came to him they figured he'd been dead no heart uh, no uh, heart activity no breathing for 12 hours and they called the doctor and said, he's dead, Jim. And the doctor said, warm him up. 
as Dennis has told me, I guess paramedics say you're not dead till you're warm and dead. So, and, and indeed, he came back and he's doing okay, minus just a couple fingers and toes, but other than that, he's doing fine. So there is a lot in nature that we just need to figure out and copy. Uh, and we've been pretty good at copying nature, even though some of our most prominent scientists didn't think that we'd be able to do so. Historically, some of our religious leaders were against cryonics. Now, I come from a religious upbringing, and I think that biblically, we have a God-given ability to do this and a responsibility not to squander those gifts. Muhammad Ali said something interesting. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world that they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion. And I think this is something that uh, Dr. Ettinger would agree with. No, did I skip something? No. Now things have changed since I became involved with cryonics 40 years ago. And certainly since our founder, Robert Ettinger, first proposed the idea of cryonics. Um, then people thought I was crazy. Today, people think it will work, but it's not for them. Um, so, but I do think that Dr. Ettinger was right when he said several years ago that we have the wind in our sails. The question is, how long will it take for cryonics to succeed? And is there a better way to help it happen sooner and do something good for the world along the way? The Society for Cryobiology has been very negative toward cryonics. Governments won't fund research into cryonics because the public doesn't ask them to. Eventually, I have no doubt, as I said, the cryonics will be successful, but we've been trying to squeeze a square peg into a round hole. The public may not think it's impossible anymore, and that's great, but let's face it. People are just not, most people are just not interested in cryonics. It occurred to me that people are fine using cryotechniques for surgery, um, but that is a very short-term process and will likely not lead to the breakthroughs needed for cryonics. But a few years ago, I thought to myself, what if we try to do something that the vast majority of people today think is important? Something that we really need and something that not only will benefit cryonics research, but which is imperative to cryonics, a necessary precursor or stepping stone to the success of cryonics. And it is right there in front of our faces. I just donated $10 worth of higher fries to help make organ transplants safer, less costly, and more available to those in need. My name is Sharita. Join me. Click on the link below to read more about the prize and to donate $10. And be sure to share this video with your friends and family. Thank you, Sharita. Organ transplants have been done successfully for only a handful of decades. Yet we practically take them for granted. But they are difficult, expensive, and time sensitive. And though they've only been done successfully for a relatively short period of time, in many ways, the process is the same as when most people had rotary dial telephones. If a kidney is not transplanted within 36 hours, it dies. If a liver is not transplanted within 12 to 16 hours, it dies. Typically, lungs need to be transplanted in under eight hours, and a heart within six. That's a very short window of time. If a heart becomes available in Los Angeles at midnight, and the recipient is asleep in Nevada, Imagine those six hours. The difficulty of quickly assembling the necessary team of experts. Transportation costs. Preparing a patient. The people involved in this process are amazing, and they do miraculous work. But if that window could be expanded, there would be more time to prepare the team and the patient. Transportation costs would be reduced dramatically. Safety could be enhanced, and more lives would be saved. One way to extend this time is to develop a reliable way 
to temporarily freeze an organ, as we now do with sperm, eggs, and embryos, and when ready, to revive the organ and implant it into the patient. The organ cryopreservation process, the cryoplast, was established to help make this happen. Initially planned to be $50,000, the prize will be given to the first person or group that successfully freezes and restores one of several mammalian organs to full function. Details are on the website below. The prize is administered by a federally recognized 501c3 nonprofit organization. Donations are tax deductible to the extent allowed by law. You can mail in a check, you can donate online. The bigger the prize, the more likely that this procedure will soon become a reality. With your help, the prize could grow far beyond our initial goal of fifty thousand dollars. So share, share this, this with a friend and, and join us. Join us. Donate ten dollars for the cost of two large specialty cups of coffee. You can be, you a, part can be a part of this adventure, adventure. and possibly, possibly change the world. Everyone that I've spoken with knows someone who has had or needs an organ transplant or knows someone who knows someone who has. So I ask you, do you? I bet you do. I have a friend that I talked about, talked with about cryonics for 30 years and no, but when I mentioned this project related to organ transplants, her eyes lit up and she said, yes, this is important. You've talked to me about cryonics for 30 years, but that really doesn't mean anything to me. But this, this is important. Now this picture, which I took out of the video, really does not tell the full story. Kidneys, yes, you have 36 hours. And if a kidney doesn't work when it's implanted, you can often replace the kidney with a second kidney, maybe even a third. Not so with lungs. Lungs is pretty much a one-time thing. If you don't get a good set of lungs in there the first time, that person is going to die. So when lungs are found in a donor, they have eight hours to test those lungs, make sure that they're perfect, and then implant them into the recipient. Because of this, we lose 80% of some donated organs because we can't take anything except the best of the best. We can't take a chance. If we could freeze the organs while further testing is going on, then we can, of course, we got a phone call. Oh, sorry. If we could freeze the organs, then we can uh, take time needed to do the testing. We can possibly utilize all of those organs that are now being wasted. And you know what? We have enough donated organs now so that if we could use those organs, no one need be on a waiting list or die waiting for an organ transplant, just with the organs that are donated today. So, with the help of some friends, we have the CryoPrize project, something that almost everyone thinks is important, something that is a necessary stepping stone to cryonics. In the Star Trek episode, Mirror Mirror, Captain Kirk encourages the Spock and the barbaric alternate universe to try to change things. The alternate Spock says that one man cannot summon the future, to which Kirk replies, and I think Dr. Ettinger would agree, but one man can change the present. I ask each of you here to be that one person. We have all seen Thomas Edison's comments about genius being 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. I remember a professor in college in a media class said that studies have shown that people watch the news because it makes them feel like they're doing something. But the reality is, to do something, you have to do something. Uh, there is a Jewish proverb from Ethics of the Fathers which says, it is not incumbent upon you to complete the task, but neither are you free to ignore it. The cryo prize needs your help. I need your help. I want this to be not a $50,000 prize, but a million dollar prize. We need donations from people. We need pledges from corporations. Can you imagine? They can support organ transplant research and not pay a dime unless it's successful. 
We need people who are better fundraisers than I am. We need people to run our Facebook page and create other social media. I need people to let the research community know that this exists. And I've been doing this kind of thing for over 40 years. I'd like to retire in a couple of years. I need somebody who's willing to start now working on this so that we can train together and maybe finish the project in two years, or if not, someone else could take over and run this project. Help us make organ transplants safer, less costly, and more available. It's a valiant and necessary project in its own right. And by virtue of this, we could help make cryonics a reality. This actually is from an earlier talk. It has nothing to do with what I'm talking about now. I just want to make sure you're still awake. In case I didn't mention it, here's our website and Facebook page. Take it down. In case I didn't mention it, here's our website and Facebook page. No, this is not a recording. Call me day or night. Let's push to the limit to make organ vitrification a reality. If we do that, cryonics will succeed and much likely much and likely much sooner than it would otherwise. Um, I read a quote this morning from the Dalai Lama. It said, there are only two days in the year that nothing can be done. One is called yesterday and the other is called tomorrow. Today is the right day to love, believe, do, and mostly live. So I leave you with a general thought. Life is hard. And especially in these difficult times, uh, but really always, let's try our best to help each other. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, appreciate it and all the hard work you've done for the Cranix Institute as well as for the Cryo Prize. Our next speaker uh, is gonna be Rudy Hoffman. He's a certified financial planner and CEO of Hoffman Planning. Uh, whether he's handling uh, Cryonix and Cryonix suspension funding and insurance for Elcor or the Cryonix Institute, uh, he can assure that his, uh, his legacy planning for a better future uh, we can count on him and we to optimize, optimize and enhance your situation. Uh, Rudy, uh, welcome. Oh, let me just turn off your, or turn on your speaker. Huh? Mute, check one, 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 check mute, check. All right, check. I can hear you. I can All hear right. you now. And uh, hey, everybody. Oh, Joe Kowalski, bravo, my friend. You have hit it out of the park. I uh, am moved emotionally and logically by your beautiful presentation. Anybody else thought that was terrific besides me? I love that guy. Uh, I'm doing a screen share. I want to see if we got a full screen. Let me know if you can see that. Yes. I need to go to changing this mode to um, the display the settings. We want that looks about right. And I think we can uh, go to work here. All right. I would love to be able to see everybody if I could see. I wish I could see all your beautiful smiling faces throughout the entire planet. It is an amazing thing that we are doing here. This is the future and we've arrived in some ways, but uh, it's a little unseamless in some ways. So we're going to do the best we can. And thank you for hanging tough, everybody. Uh, let's talk about um, uh, two basic uh, issues that I want to make sure we get clear here. We know that uh, the Cryonics is a good, uh, currently unproven, but real life extension uh, strategy, and it's affordable through life insurance. Um, this is a bit of a quick bit about me. Uh, I've been a Cryonics member since 94. I'm personally signed up uh, for 24, 20, 26 years now, since 94. My wife signed up. Uh, my dog, this is Hermione. Hermione is cryopreserved as we speak at the Cryonics Institute as of the uh, last C. Uh, uh, so basically I'm licensed in 48, a lot of states. And um, this is, may or may not be the right presentation. How exciting is that? After uh, 
trying working really hard to make sure all everything is exactly seamless. Um, the but I'm gonna just kind of fly through it anyway because I think that uh, this is yes this is okay this is indeed the right presentation great news great news you I, I love this uh, you may have seen this particular uh, um, cartoon it's kind of described the human condition for uh, basically about as long as most of people can remember you kind of going over the cliff of death how many have seen that one. And uh, the whole idea, of course, of cryonics, as we know, and this is pre preaching to the choir. I suspect most of you are already signed up, but we want to get you some new information. This is, of course, to help you bridge that gap. And one of the ways we can do that is make darn sure that your financing piece is solid. And I know I'm preaching to people who are pretty serious, dedicated cryonicists uh, on this conference video here, but I want to suggest to you that no matter how serious you think you are, you may not be serious enough. This stuff is very, very important. It is vital that all of us do everything we can do to make sure every piece of this process is nailed down. And I want to submit to you that the financial piece is a piece that we can really nail down. And one of the things that we can announce today, and I'm very excited about this, is a basically a much more solid way we have of not just financing your cryonics itself, but financing the next step. The next step, of course, is cryonics estate planning. I wish you, I can only see the seven members of the, of the board here. How many of you have done something about your cryonics estate planning? Can I see some hands in the air? Yeah, I see those. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Uh, I almost said gentlemen. Thank you, Debbie. The uh, basically the, the next step in cryonics planning is getting your your cryonics basic cryonics funded. Make sure everything is absolutely funded. Not just the piece for CI. You got to make sure that transportation piece is solidly funded. You got to make sure the logistics are there. But the next thing is also making sure that you've got some bunch of money ideally when you wake up. And those of us who are serious about our cryonics have been working on this for a long time. I've been doing trying to figure out how to do cryonics estate planning for over 25 years. And I'm pleased to tell you that the, a lot of that's been summarized here in this book that we're writing called Maybe You Can Take It With You, the Cryonics Estate Planning Handbook. Here's a, I've summarized the contents here. And uh, I'm just gonna fly through this just to get you, give you some sense of what is in this book which I think you'll like about the information because we're gonna make it available to you for free. Um, and free is something even tightwad cryonicists can live with. Can I get a smile? Oh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, we got, we got, one, we got one responsive human being. Would you have the, the people I can see, would you please jump up and down so I can make sure you're actually alive? Thank you. All right, they, uh, we know that uh, basically cryonics estate planning is real. Look at this. This is a goddamn big deal. That's a huge, big old monster trust that is a solid cryonics trust. This is basically, this information has been set up by the way my the person who did set up more cryonics trusts than anybody else on the planet, uh, Peggy Hoyt and her team. And she is my co-author along with one other co-author on this book. So I wanna go you just give you a quick summary of one of the, some of the chapters here. Basically the, uh, what we need is a, a whole package that, and I know that uh, for instance, David Edger, some of the rest of you are attorneys, you know that getting things set up correctly is not an accident. It's a matter of intent. It's a matter of sweating the details. So that's why this is a big book. This is summary is 15 chapters. So basically one of the big factors is this. And one of the things that kept, there's a couple of big things that kept us, you know, that basically have been challenges in the Quranic estate planning. One, when you're dead, you have no rights. The dead have no rights. You're an ex person, like the ex uh, parrot. Uh, but the so we have structured most cryonics trusts basically utilize a dynasty trust format that does a does a workaround around that whole process to whether to determine whether you as a cryonicist are dead and have rights. But we use a, tr a trust format that has been around over a hundred years that sidesteps that issue. The second big question is how in the world do you find somebody that can manage the money? 
That's been a huge challenge. We've had a couple of banks and big organizations that we dealt with for years that we thought that we had to deal with them and then they bailed on us. But the good news is now we're working with Raymond James and a trust company that will manage the money. We even have structures to have guardianships over that, over that trust. So that's kind of cool. They, we need a durable financial power of attorney. Healthcare directives are obviously very important. You got to make sure you've put somebody in a situation where if you cannot make that those decisions, that they will make the right decisions to get you a good cryo preservation. Uh, and again, that is not uh, an accident. It's a function of being working with professionals who basically are really highly skilled to make sure these things happen. Hello, Mary Ruert, glad you're there. Uh, your cryonic friendly living will basically obviously you want to make sure that you have you put instructions down so that you, the plug is pulled at the right time. Obviously avoiding a t autopsy is something that's vital. Quick personal aside, Alcor had a one of their this is a big this is big big time to share something that's that's real. One of the long term activists in um, cryonics was autopsied. Uh, happened this year. Too bad. Terrible thing. Tragic. It can happen to any of us, even those of us who think we got our act together. Uh, there, so the point being, there is a now a structure for um, Kranich's estate planning, and it is good. Uh, let us get to the bottom line. What do these things cost? Well, the my Peggy Hoyt, in our 1,200-page in our book or so, we don't go into this trust. But since it's just us chickens, here's the cost. Uh, it's about three to 6,000 bucks to set up a Koranix Trust correctly. But that is a huge amount of work that's making sure it's individually customized for you. It includes asset protection. It includes tax protection. It includes taking care of your pets, a whole bunch of stuff that you you could, that are in addition to the whole Koranix piece. The other thing is you have it, you can use the leverage of life insurance to fund money going into those trusts. This is a big, huge deal. And here's why I have $3 million of life insurance on me. Anybody else, you got 3 million bucks of coverage on you? All uh, right, nobody else is stupid as I am. But I tell you what, we got 11 policies. One of the reasons we got that 3 million bucks with total 11 policies is we want to have money to make sure that we get the best possible cryopreservation, don't you? That's why you're signed up. But it wouldn't be also nice to have some money going into an individual trust. And the cool thing about it is if you use life, an extra life insurance policy, that doesn't reduce the amount of money that's going to your family. It doesn't reduce the amount of money that go into the people you care about. You can have extra money going to CI. You can have extra money go into suspended animation or maybe other organizations and people you care about. The lab magic of life insurance does phenomenal things that you can use, including going into this trust. So let's talk about affordability. Let's do let's, the, uh, we know that Koranix planning is generally affordable through, le through the leverage of life insurance. How many of us use life insurance to fund our crowd preservation? Thank you for those hands. I, I wanna see those hands going up across the world. I know you can't see, I raise your hand anyway. God damn it, be interactive. Wake up. All right, so the uh, the whole idea is leverage of life insurance. How much leverage is possible? Well, look at this guy. Well, we this is he's a normal dude, PhD student, and like a lot of PhD students, he's early and poor in his career. Uh, so you know, in this case, he's doing a four hundred thousand dollar policy for about three hundred forty four bucks a year. Now, term life insurance is perfect for a lot of things. For a lot of reasons, it's not ideal for Koranix funding. But meanwhile, in the early years, what it does is enable you to get signed up and get your process going. And look at this. If it's, if it's 150,000 bucks for the whole C package with goes for CI, suspended animation, private air ambulance, and that's a global cost maybe of not 28 or 35,000, maybe it's 150,000. But that still leaves, means you got an extra, but $250,000 and he can direct to organizations he cares about. He can add that add that money going to his family, have that money going to CI, have that money going to an individual Koranix trust. The leverage of life insurance lets you do really cool things. And it's also cool to know that you can have a policy that will build a savings plan that means you can stop paying on the thing eventually. And if, or if you lie, there's a 29 year old buying a $300,000 index universal life policy. Index universal life policies let the cash accumulation grow with an indirect exposure to the S&P 
average about seven plus percent tax free. So all of a sudden this guy's invested a buck 85 a month, but his cash value, the party doesn't have to die to get, projects to $1.7 million. Uh, now that's at age 100 to be fair, but even 65, it's a lot. Or at these premiums in about seven, in about 12 to 17 years, the policy will simply pay itself. He can stop paying on the policy. So what's that again? That means a solid policy that's in place in the later years, folks, when we tend to die, you need that policy to be in place then. That's why you want a permanent policy instead of term, by the way. Uh, let's take a look at another example. Here's a 45 year old uh, individual buying an IUL. You can pay this thing over various ways. You can pay it with a single payment of 65,000 or 12, 12,000 a year for six payments or seven payments or pay it annually. So there's different ways to structure your program here. And we do have a new, I'm gonna, this guy he is 70 years old. So at the time you get to 70, your cost of life insurance, let's face it, goes up. But even at 70, it still often makes sense to use leverage. of Life insurance is about 7,700 bucks for 160,000. But there's a new system that's just brand new this year. So it didn't get in this slide because it's so new. And that is we now can do guaranteed death benefit variable annuities. It basically mean you restructure, reposition money without worrying about underwriting. You still control the money. It grows at a, at a, in a series of mutual funds that are ready to return that's been better than 10% per year for the last 20 years. Because there's a guaranteed death benefit, the Quranics organization, CI and Alcor, are very comfortable with it. But it, meanwhile, lets you control, can maintain the money. You, uh, the money still maintain, stays in your name with CI as the irrevocable beneficiary. For many people, especially if you're uninsurable, the best of all possible worlds. That's a new thing that's only been available the last year or so. So we're pretty excited about that. So um, here's our call to action. Uh, you know, where I'm happy to have, get you in uh, a, a digital copy if you'd like of the, the original book. Maybe you, maybe you can take it with you. The, this is the, my original book. Maybe you can beat death and taxes, the affordable immortal. And I, that's on that's on a uh, I got this on a PDF file, which means in addition, instead of if you don't want to go to, to Amazon.com and pay 13 bucks for it. Email me at Rudy Hoffman, Rudy, Rudy Hoffman .com, and I'll send you a PDF file of it for free, which is, again, workable for tightwads like us. Uh, and the, here's something else. Uh, if you want the, the, uh, the, my new book, which we're, is not even published yet, won't be published for probably a month and a half, two months, but we've got nearly all of it put together on a uh, uh, Google Docs file. And uh, if you will, we, if we can trust you to not change it, we can actually literally send you the, the uh, unpublished manuscript that is the, uh, the full package, the full thing. Again, I, my, we're, we're authors, but basically we want to make, first and foremost, we're committed to making the Quranics industry, the Quranics world as real and solid and well-funded as possible. That means we got to have you personally leading by example as to what you can do. And if, if I can share information that may help, I'd be honored to do that. Uh, this is still a bridge in this developing and we know this. There's a metaphor that all of us can figure out. Eventually it's going to look, look more like this. And uh, so if you'd be kind enough to uh, join me in our marvelous future, do everything you can do to get your uh, financing for Cranix as solid as possible and you're gonna feel really good every time you look at your wrist and see that bracelet, every time you think about what you've done. Thank you very much for your attention. Rudy Hoffman out. And Thank you so much, Rudy. Uh, fantastic, all the hard work that you've been doing for Cryonics and all the hard work you've done in the insurance and trust fields. Uh, I think uh, it goes without saying how much you're appreciated. Thank, thank you, you very much, Dennis. And thank you everybody throughout the world. Rudy out. All right. So our next speaker um, is going to be Dr. Mary Ruert. Uh, she's a research scientist, ethicist, and a, li a libertarian author, activist. She received her bachelor's in science in biochemistry in 1970 
and her PhD in biophysics in 74, both from the Michigan State University. Her subsequent career includes positions at St. Louis University, the Upjohn Company of Kalamazoo, Michigan. As a senior research scientist at Upjohn, Dr. Ruert was involved in developing new therapies for a variety of diseases, including uh, liver cirrhosis and AIDS. Dr. Ruert uh, left Upjohn in 1995 to devote her time to consulting and writing. Her communications course for science scientists has received high prize from attendees. She also provides consulting services for uh, neutral companies, clinical research organizations, and universities. Between 2003 and 2006, Dr. Ruert was an adjunct associate professor of biology at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. During that time, she served with the Center for Applied and Professional Ethics, designing a medical research ethics course for the university. Her innovation, innovative application of ethics to medical regulation, especially regulations regarding pharmaceuticals, has life and death implications. Since 1982, Dr. Ruert was also has been involved in societal ethics with the focus on the political theory and practice of libertarianism. Her award-winning international best-selling book, Healing Our World, demonstrates how the ethical application of libertarian principles has historically created harmony and abundance. Welcome, Dr. Huruert. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Again, I guess. <laughs> I grew up in the Detroit area, so I found out about cryonics when I think I was in high school and was able to attend some of the cryonics meetings uh, with Dr. Edinger, and that was, that was great. <laughs> and I guess the reason that I'm here today is because I, I spoke at one of the meetings, and I, I don't recall the exact details of that, but some of the names are familiar. Uh, Pat Heller's name's familiar, Joe Kowalski, um, of course, David Edinger. So I may have met you uh, many, many years ago. I, I don't recall, but uh, um, I do recognize your name. So, you know, I'm, it's glad to be back. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what I did in the field of cryobiology. I have a couple publications there that I'll just briefly show you. But I also wanna talk about how, you know, the libertarian philosophy really would, um, if it were, implemented in this country instead of us moving away from it uh, would actually be very helpful to the cryonics movement and and that's i think what i can contribute to you today so i'm going to try to share my screen i do have some slides although i can uh, i can do without if i need to well i'm seeing everything but my powerpoint let's see here we go no there we go no that's not it Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm not sure why I'm not showing. Let me, let me do this and then let me share. Let's try that. Ah, there we go. Okay. So are you seeing that or not? Is it, is it sharing or not? Ah, it is good. Okay. So, um, I went to Michigan state as, uh, as you've heard, and one of the first things I did there, I was able to get in the research lab very early, which was great because that's what I wanted to do. And as you can see, there were a couple publications that were, that resulted from that work I did um, partly as an undergrad, partly as a graduate student. And basically I, what I realized when I did this research is things were a lot more complex than, than I probably had imagined as a young person in terms of what we needed to have for a successful cryonics preservation. And of course, I, I really appreciate what Joe was saying. I think that's the way to go because it's very, very difficult to believe that, for most people to believe that they're going to be frozen and brought back if we can't even do it to an organ. So that's, I think that's a great way to go. Now, I told you that I would talk a little bit about why the libertarian philosophy takes us to a better place in cryogenics. And, you know, basically the libertarian philosophy is very much a freedom philosophy. Uh, it, it, libertarians believe in what we call the non-aggression principle, 
We don't initiate force, fraud, or theft against others. And if we do, on purpose or not on purpose, we try to make things right again. Unfortunately, the government does initiate force against its citizens, and that's widely accepted today. And uh, if, if any of you are not sure about what I'm saying, I'm happy to go into detail uh, a little later on that. But the reason freedom is so important and the libertarian uh, vision of freedom is very much, very close, I should say, to what our founding fathers had. Not exactly, but very close. And I want to show you why that's important because if a country isn't free, it doesn't have much wealth creation. And what you're seeing on your screen right now is the GNP per capita from, 19, from 1750 to 1977. And what you'll notice is the developing countries, which are shown in the upper graph, the, the, the uh, diamonds, if you will, uh, what you see is that after 19 or 1750, it really started going up. And to really appreciate what this meant, you have to realize that before 1750, we really, all of us pretty much, were living on less than a dollar a day throughout the world for the entirety of humankind. So something happened to change things, and that something was the freedom that was uh, a part of and resulted from the American Revolution and the establishment of the United States. Coincidentally, Britain <laughs> underwent its own more peaceful revolution and dropped a lot of its taxation and regulation and tariffs and, and things that really were destroying the economy as well. And so Britain was able to join in the um, Industrial Revolution. And Europe, of course, was undergoing their time of throwing out their monarchs or minimizing them so that more freedom happened in Europe too. And it too uh, joined the developed countries. But if you notice the third world shown on the graph with the blocks, um, it really didn't do very much at all. And has just now really started to take off. And that's because in those countries, freedom was still suppressed. So it made a big difference whether or not you had freedom, uh, which is uh, a greater, you can think of it as a greater adherence to the non-aggression principle that I just talked about. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because the per capita income is directly related to your life expectancy in years. And so obviously, not only do you wanna be able to have a higher per capita income, but you want to be able to live longer because that maximizes your chances of having the right cryonics system in place when it's your time. Or it will also uh, help you, of course, keep your body as well as it can be as we learn more and more about the science. So this is a very important thing is to have this freedom so we can produce greater wealth. And another way of putting this um, is the measurement of economic freedom, uh, which is done uh, annually. And here you can see the GDP per capita. And you can see that if you take all the countries in the world, the least free countries really don't have much um, income, whereas the most free countries do. And so it's very, very important to maintain that freedom if we want cryonics to be successful. Now, what happens when we're not free? Well, really, another way of looking at it is what percentage of the GDP does the government spend? And here, you see, when the government spends greater than 60% of the GDP, the average annual growth of real GDP is much, much lower than it is if it's less than 25%. So one way of thinking about this is the more freedom we have, we, the less government interference and less government spending we have. And when government spending goes down, our GDP or GNP, however you want to think of it, goes up. And our per capita income goes up. 
So that's all very good because that means there's more money to do research for cryonics. And, and that's great because, you know, if we want to really make cryonics work, we need a lot more research than we have now. And so we need a big investment in the research and, and we can't do it if people are simply trying to get by. And that's gonna be a big problem for fundraising, even for things like organ preservation, because people have been so hard hit economically by the COVID crisis that you know, they don't have what they might've had just a year ago. Now there is another threat from uh, too much government spending, and that is that when government spends, it doesn't always tax us because it would be obvious that we're being heavily taxed and we wouldn't like that and the politicians wouldn't get reelected. So what they often do is the government borrows money. And when it does that, it's basically creating inflation. And you know, no matter how big of a life insurance policy we might have, if inflation runs rampant, the money that we have invested is not going to give us the kind of return that we want either to help us preserve our bodies or to have when we are revived. Now, I'm just gonna show you, and most of you I'm sure know this because you're, you're all kind of in my age group, it looks, most of you anyhow. So you know that the dollar, which started out in about 1870 at $100, uh, $100 is now worth about 569 cents. So money loses value very quickly. And of course, a lot of this was because the Federal Reserve started up, gold redemption changed. But a lot of it's going to continue because our government is spending and spending and spending and not taxing us to make up for it. So it's, it's coming out through inflation. This is very bad. It's bad because, like I said, it's hard for us to predict how much money we actually need to set aside to make sure that our bodies will be preserved and that we don't run out of money for that and that we have some if we're revived. So that's my little short spiel on why it's important to think in terms of being a libertarian. And if you want to learn more, you can go to my website at ruart.com and look at some of the things I've written. Healing Our World is, is the book that um, Dennis mentioned, and it's The Compassion of Libertarianism, How to Enrich the Poor, Protect the Environment, Deter Crime, and Diffuse Terrorism. I mean, isn't that what we want from our politics? <laughs> so, and it's got over a thousand references. So you don't have to take my word for anything. You can read the peer-reviewed studies that show this. All I've done is piece it all together. Um, a short answers to the tough questions is, you know, a kind of a, how can I say it? I, I, I as a, was a libertarian candidate many, many times, so many times I can't even remember. And so I used to have to do sound bites uh, when people ask questions about libertarianism. And then I started writing a column for the Advocates for Self-Government for 20 years. And what you're seeing with short answers to the tough questions is a compilation of that. My latest book, Death by Regulation, just won a couple awards. It talks about how the FDA has shaved five to 10 years off each of our lives. And um, I wrote this book primarily based on a lot of the things that I saw when I was working in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, subsequently found that so many studies had been done, all I had to do was compile the data and put it into one story. So that's what I did there as well. And really, that's, that's my talk for today. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Uh, and let me, let me stop screen sharing so I can look at the questions and see if anyone has any for me. Okay, uh, Dr. Ruert, uh, we're going to save the questions for the end. Uh, we're going to okay. do a Q&A at the end. Uh, okay. Very much appreciate your talk and everything you brought. Uh, uh, I just want to say one thing. Uh, we at Cranix Institute, uh, it's no, we don't endorse any one political party or ideology. We accept everyone, uh, regardless of, of you know, uh, left or right leaning and so forth. But uh, uh, in the spirit of sharing free information and uh, thoughts and ideas, uh, we certainly appreciate uh, your talk, and uh, we hope you do stay around for questions and answers afterwards. 
Um, our next speaker is going to be um, David Edinger. He is an attorney and uh, founding member of the Cryonics Institute, also the son of Robert Edinger, the founder of the Cryonics movement itself. David has served as CI's attorney since 1977 and has been an advocate and spokesperson on cryonics issues ever since he was 15 years old, where he actually did his first television interview on the subject. Uh, welcome, David Edinger. Thanks, Dennis. A uh, little more than 15 now, as you can see. Uh, I, I thought I'd just talk for a couple minutes today and just a little bit about historical perspective and, and what that may say about cryonics going forward. So, so just a few reminiscences and a few thoughts so that you might find interesting. Um, it's roughly 60 years since my father began writing The Prospect of Immortality, which launched the um, cryonics movement. And uh, so maybe not a bad time to reflect. And it's uh, about uh, 43 years, I guess, since the Cryonics Institute was founded. Uh, first meeting I remember was in my parents' living room, less than a dozen people there. Uh, now CI has 1,700 members. Uh, CI's first patient was my grandmother, and CI's second patient was my mother. Um, and in the first 15 years of the Cryonics Institute, those were the only patients the organization had. And of course, now there are more than 190. So uh, there's certainly been a lot of progress, but there's a lot farther to go yet. Uh, my father's view back in the day when he, just, when he began to advocate for cryonics was this was such an obvious idea that all he had to do was explain it to people and it would take off on its own. And, and of course that didn't happen. And so ultimately his conclusion was uh, that we've got to do it for ourselves. And that's still true. And I think we are making good progress. We've got to keep doing it for ourselves. And that really means um, everybody. Uh, in thinking about history, um, it occurred to me that the question of time uh, that I've just been talking about uh, is kind of central to cryonics. Um, you might even say that the fundamental cryonics premise is that timing is everything. Uh, and let me explain why I, why I think that's the case. Uh, even today in the COVID crisis, we see illustrations of the basic cryonics premise. Um, if uh, the very first patients who died of COVID-19 uh, were considerably worse off than people who are facing the disease even today, a few months later, given the advances that have occurred since then, I guess most notably, the people who are seriously ill and, and um, uh, have an overactive immune response, which kills a lot of people now are being treated with steroids and that substantially reduces mortality. So, uh, you know, if you could get your disease at the time when the treatment is ready, you could do an awful lot better. And certainly if people get, get COVID a year from now, they will be much, much better off. Um, Indeed, if metaphorically you could have frozen the whole world while we figured this one out, it would have been nice. Can't be done. But, um, but it's kind of an illustration of the fact that the Cranach's premise, which is we want to get people to where uh, the treatment is present to cure the disease. And that's why we often talk about uh, CI as an ambulance to the future. Take the patient who has the current problem, preserve the patient, and to try to get the patient to that time at which treatment is possible. So the, the first corollary I would say to timing is everything is um, the conclusion that progress is certain. Uh, I would say certain barring us completely bollocksing up the world and uh, destroying it in some way. Um, you know, technology has always led to improvements. Uh, the human body is just another machine, as my father often used to say, cheap materials. It's not a particularly well constructed machine in a lot of ways, but we're going to sooner or later figure out how to make it better constructed in lots of ways. And the people who think otherwise, uh, in terms of the march of technology, have always been proven wrong. I think Joe had one example. There are a couple I like that I, I, could, I could give you. One is that H.G. Wells, who of course was the father of science fiction and a visionary, in 1902 said, heavier than air flight is impossible, will never, never occur. So this man who was so forward thinking said this a year before the Wright brothers proved him wrong. Thomas Watson in 1940 said there will never be more than four computers in the world. Uh, this is just not something that's going to be something that a lot of people are going to need. Thomas Watson uh, was the owner of uh, and founder of the IBM Corporation. So those people who have predicted that advances are not going to be made are always wrong. And I think, you know, it's inevitable that science will progress to a point where um, the things we are dying of today will be curable tomorrow. And that's a, that's a part of the cryonics premise that I really think is, is unassailable. Many people may not believe it, but I think that anybody who disputes it is, is on the wrong side of history in every respect. 
Um, but then the second corollary uh, to timing is everything uh, is while progress may be certain, timing is never certain. Uh, and unfortunately, we never know how long it's going to take for these advances to occur. I remember, some of you may, that when Richard Nixon was president, he announced a war on cancer and the goal was to cure cancer in 10 years. Well, there's been a lot of progress about cancer, but we're very far from curing cancer and we're now talking uh, 50 years later. Uh, of course, everybody knows in uh, the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, we were supposed to have hotels in, in, in space. Uh, we don't have those uh, and, and nobody has their flying cars. Uh, so we don't know how long it's gonna take for these things to happen. And while aging research is progressing, and that's, that's helpful to everybody, uh, we certainly can't count on that happening within any of our lifetimes. Uh, maybe we'll get lucky. Uh, if I don't have to be frozen, if aging research announces enormous successes, uh, well, I'm still around, that'd be great. Uh, my father always said, to use another one of his little corny but funny expressions, um, being frozen is a terrible thing. It's just that the alternative is even worse. And I think that's still gonna be true for the foreseeable future. So I don't think you can count on a cure for aging by a given date. I don't think you can count on being uploaded as a solution to your problems by a given date, even if you believe that uploading would, would, would save you. I have my doubts about that. Uh, we're going to need cryonics to bridge that great gap. Um, we're, I'm glad it's here uh, for all of us. And uh, I'm glad that my mother and my father and the other founders of the Cranix organization, uh, Jack Erfurt and Andrea Foote, uh, Walter Runkel, are, are suspended at the CI's facility and kept in the state they were in when they died. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to protect them and preserve them when the treatment does catch up to the disease. That's the fundamental Cranix premise. It's, it's, more, it's as true today as ever. And every scientific advance proves it more true. And so, uh, I think we all want to be, we all should be optimistic and uh, continue towards our goal. Thanks, Dennis. Dennis? All right. Th yep. <laughs> th thank you so much, David. Uh, you might want to adjust your camera. You got it uh, tilted to the point that you can just barely see your head there. Oh, really? Now yeah. You, now you tell me. Well, I'm not yeah, you, looking anyhow, so it doesn't, didn't matter that much. But Yeah, you, you're, you're looking shorter. <laughs> yeah. Right now, you can't see my head because to me, I, it looks like I'm right in picture. Um, the bottom of your chin is cut off just a little bit. Yep, okay. there you go. <laughs> okay. uh, anyways, um, so that concludes our speakers section. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, the progress that's been going on at CI, uh, as well as, uh, you know, my favorite topic. I always like to talk and, and remind people about standby and especially uh, emergency notification. If the Cranix organization, if the standby organization doesn't know that you're in a dire situation, then we can't do anything about helping you. So, uh, you know, some of the simplest things like just wearing a bracelet, wearing a necklace, uh, having, if you live alone, having a friend or family member check in on you uh, on a regular basis. CI does have the phone app. Uh, it's back up. This phone app, uh, uh, was down for a little bit. We had some problems with the uh, Google Play Store. Um, they added some additional uh, regulations and how we're able to uh, promote the apps. But uh, after we uh, made some tweaking and a couple changes, we're able to use that app, at least on the Android phone. We're still working on the Apple version of that. Um, how it works, basically, it's a little timer, goes off and says, hey, are you okay? Are you all right? And if you don't respond, uh, it eventually will send a warning message to your designated family or friends who should either come to check on you, call 911, and or uh, 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 notify the Cranix Institute that there's a potential emergency. It's just a little something. It's free. There's no charge for it. Uh, we put time and effort into it, and it's there for all Cranix members. And even if you're not even involved in Cranix, it's a great way to check up on elderly family members if they are at least technologically sophisticated enough to uh, be able to operate a smart smartphone in the apps. And as you can tell, not everything is easy uh, technologically. In fact, uh, during our Q&A, uh, we're going to go over some questions, and uh, I'm going to try to work and get that video back up for everyone so you can uh, see what I was trying to present in the beginning. 
so, but uh, bottom line, standby is important. Think about your own in individual standby situation and what could or couldn't go wrong. There's tons of information and docu documentation on the website, check it out. Um, also, uh, progress wise, uh, our latest numbers uh, are 192 human patients. Um, I think that shows that our, you know, we're seeing exponential growth there. Uh, 191 pet patients, so almost tied there. Um, 1,722 members, just fantastic. We're, we're growing in that area. And I mean, on the one hand, when you look at how many, you know, billions of people that there are in the world, a couple thousands, not a lot, but uh, from our humble beginnings of where we started, we're still, uh, we're, we're chugging along and we're starting to gain in membership exponentially. Um, so, um, and last but not least, probably uh, the most important uh, thing that a lot of people are waiting for are the election results. So I have those now. Um, the ballot count is uh, Shannon Blevins, 22, Steve Loix, 89, uh, Stefan Beauregard, 96, and myself, 133, and Andy Zawaki, 164. So it looks like the incumbent directors all are reelected. Congratulations. And uh, thank you. And uh, to Shannon Blevins, thank you for stepping up. Don't get discouraged. Uh, we appreciate your throwing your hat in the ring. Um, you know, you can still volunteer and help out and continue uh, doing what you're doing. Uh, so for everyone, um, Again, uh, it's a testament to democracy uh, that uh, we uh, we had another uh, successful um, and uh, positive election. And uh, I think we're going to go, we're going to slide into our questions and answers and it's going to be a little uh, less formal. Um, the panelists can kind of chime in if they want to take a question. And uh, next after that, we're going to finish up with the Immortal Society meeting. Um, and that'll be headed off by uh, Debbie Fleming, also CI director. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to ask the panelists to unmute themselves. And let's see here. Ready to go. All right. And uh, also uh, going into the q and I saw some excellent questions. Uh, I'll take the first question. Uh, does CI have an emergency plan for power outages and civil unrest? So uh, when it comes to powder, power outages, it's a common misconception that the cryostats are run on electricity and that there could be a power failure. Um, the cryostats are much like giant thermos bottles where liquid nitrogen is inside them and they're insulated really well takes many months for that liquid nitrogen to boil off. So even if we had no power, we'd be able to, uh, the, the patients would be protected for quite some time. Um, no, no plan is perfect out there, but I think we've got a good solid plan. We've had no incidents going all the way back from when we started in 1976. Uh, and if there was any power failures, we also have backup generators and other contingencies. As far as any crime or civil unrest, we have uh, a lot of security features that we, some that we publish and some that we don't. Um, we have got uh, live feed cameras that are, uh, record all activities inside and outside of the Cranix Institute uh, that also stream to the internet. So uh, we have other deterrents and security systems, but we usually don't get, go into naming everything that we have um, uh, just as a matter of caution. For, for people who are worried about civil unrest, I should just say for those of you who may be elsewhere in the world, uh, you know, some of the reports of what's happened in the United States recently are probably greatly exaggerated. And certainly there, there has been nothing that has occurred in the Detroit area uh, other than 99% peaceful protests and none of the protests in any event were within 20 miles of our facility. So, uh, you know, there's no prospect of civil unrest. I mean, nobody can predict what will happen in 100 years. 
but um, we're protected against anything that's at all likely or unlikely. Okay, the next question uh, I see in the Q&A, uh, what is the best way to deposit funds so that they are available after you, I imagine it was gonna say after you uh, are revived or after you deanimate. Um, who wants to take that question? It would be one of, uh, David, you did uh, actually set up the trust. Yeah, CI, CI has, people have asked CI for a trust that CI would approve. And so we have a sample trust that's on the website that you could utilize. Though I would emphasize, we're not gonna be your legal advisor. And depending on where you live, the laws may be different. So you need to get your own lawyer to look at things. But we do have a trust that is an example of the kind of trust that would be acceptable to CI if you wanted CI or CI members to play a role in the trust process, uh, which of course is your choice. And if you look that over and your lawyer has questions, of course, we're happy to talk about it. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, you need to find your own lawyer and figure out what works best for you. Rudy, I think, uh, is Rudy still on? Yep, I'm here. Check one, check one. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, in your book that you, that's uh, was some of the main yeah, topics. Yeah, that, that, that question is certainly one of the more central questions about Cranix estate planning. How in the world do you structure a someone to run the money while you're not there? And people say, well, yeah, my family could run it, but they have a, automatically a, a conflict of interest. So the idea is that you have a corporate trustee and the... Uh, uh, short response is Raymond James has agreed to do, be a trustee and we actually have a person, Raymond Justin Cairns, who has been working with us over a couple of years attending the uh, annual Cryonics estate planning meetings that we've been having for 15 years now and uh, basically has got his people on board to do cryonics trust management. And of course, the next level of that is we have the cryonics trust uh, man people who watch over the trustees. And those are basically called the trust protectors that are typically younger cryonicists who understand what we're trying to do and whose job it is to the, watch the watchers in essence. So while nothing can be certain, we do, we've, we believe we've got some structures that are pretty solid um, and under most reasonable to be expected circumstances. Okay, thank you, Rudy. Yeah, uh, let, me add, let me add one thing, Dennis, to that, and that is we have had experiences with longtime members who had trusts set up and their children were the trustees and they assumed their children would carry out their wishes. And then after they died and there were, um, uh, the children did not entirely carry out their wishes. Uh, yes. So no, nobody's saying nobody's saying don't trust your kids or don't trust your family. But on the other hand, you know, some uh, people have some people have decided that they want to uh, that they want to uh, use people as, as trustees who have some chronic affiliation if that's their primary goal. So it's just something for you to think about. Absolutely. If I can just add to that, because I I, do, I am I am going to say don't trust your family. Don't, don't even trust your wife. Sorry. But what we want to do is put things where we structurally avoid conflict of interest situations where basically where people don't have the idea, hey, listen, if I don't make the call to CI on time, I all of a sudden get this money. We want to avoid that structural conflict of interest in the way we we, we get your Cryonix funding set up. David, I think we did uh, talk about that subject recently in some advice that we put on our website uh, as far as trying to structure uh, your will in such a way that notifying CI would be a benefit to the person. But if let's, for instance, in my own particular will, if I pass away and nobody, if, if my family stands in the way purposefully, or if they try to sue the Cranix organization, the way my will is structured, the way I wrote it out, it says that they're going to be basically disinherited. But if they honor my wishes and they have me sent into cryogenic suspension and they do everything they're supposed to do, they're going to get the bulk of my inheritance. They're going to get the bulk of my life insurance money. But the Cranix Institute will get my funding plus a little bit of overfunding. And 
whatever other funding that I've set aside for, for the future. And uh, so that way I feel as if I've put the carrots and sticks in the right place. Bravo. Yeah, I think you're talking about two different things, though, which are both important. One is what's going to happen right when you die or deanimate, whatever you want to call it, and go into the tank and what's going to happen with your assets at that point. And the other is the longer term, what's going to happen with your trust after that fact. And, um, and they're both really important points to talk about. Uh, another question, uh, what is the future of on-site uh, perfusionists now that Hillary is no longer with the Grand X Institute? Uh, well, I can address that. Um, even though Hillary is not a full-time employee with the Grand X Institute anymore, we still have contracted with her um, to do uh, jobs as they come. So if we need her as a perfusionist, she can come in and still do perfusions for us. We, we've not dissolved that relationship. We also still have uh, a relationship with, um, um, help me out with the other funeral Walsh. home. Yeah, Walsh, Walsh James Walsh uh, funeral home. So we have got multiple backups for that. And uh, so we're, we're covered. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, one question that's come up quite a bit is, uh, well, we kind of answered it a little bit as far as the civil unrest, but uh, more specifically, uh, this question has come up quite a bit and uh, people want to know how COVID has affected operations at the Koranix Institute and uh, if it's caused any problems with uh, receiving patients in any way. Um, the short answer is no, it hasn't really changed things. And that's because ever since we, we started handling patients and handling bodies, uh, we've always had to take what's called body substance isolation precautions. So whether the person has some sort of disease like HIV, tuberculosis, hepatitis, any, any of the diseases that people tend to have, uh, we, you know, we have to worry about any bloodborne or saliva or any kind of fluids that are with these bodies. And I'm not to tr trying to be gross or anything, but we always mask up. We always suit up in Tyvek suits. Uh, we have got masks, gloves, and everything else. And we take, we clean up everything with a bleach water solution. So it's the same thing, same uh, operating procedures that I use when handling uh, emergency uh, services and patients. Uh, in the Milwaukee uh, Fire Department. Uh, we handled a lot of patients with a lot of really, even even uh, worse diseases as far as the ability to spread and, and catch them, uh, airborne diseases and so forth. And uh, so, you know, it's just a matter of due diligence and following good practice. Now, as far as getting bodies uh, transported from across borders, that is a little bit more difficult because there is delays in the shipping and logistics, but as always, um, when you're overseas, there is going to be some lag time. It, it always comes down from a practical sense, how close you are to the Kranix facility. So the further you are it's, and the less infrastructure, the harder it's going to be. And some cases uh, prior to COVID, um, certainly if you passed away in a remote area, uh, straight freeze was the only option. And in many cases, that might still be the only option. Uh, but uh, more and more people in uh, Europe and Australia, certainly uh, a couple other places across the world, Canada, they're thinking about that. And uh, this, they've been thinking about that long before COVID, and they were going through the process of setting up their own uh, perfusion uh, type situation so that they could be, um, uh, cryo preserve the patient, put them in dry ice, and then they'd have a little bit more time to ship them across borders. So again, it's kind of one of those things where nothing really has changed, um, just using due diligence and common sense. Uh, do any of the other panelists want to add anything on that? I know um, another couple questions were uh, 
what's the best way to uh, preserve money. So in the future, um, you know, in a future trust, uh, that would be a question for either Steve, Pat, or Joe. Uh, there's different ways of skinning a cat and different ways of looking at that issue. Um, if you guys want to talk briefly, maybe to well, you. Can I jump in? I don't think CI ought to be offering people economic advice. I think, you know, we, we hope we do a good job of preserving the money that CI has, but if people want to know how to preserve their own money and their own trusts, you really need to get your own financial advisor for that. We're not in the business of doing that. Good point, David. Good point. Okay. Um, I mean, there are some people that even say, you know, it's not going to be money that we're going to need in the future. We're going to need like, uh, you know, Apple cores or something. Uh, so, you know, it's not always a question of money either. Uh, is it a good, here's another question. Uh, is it a good idea to move uh, to your area later in life? Our local hospitals and uh, nursing homes familiar with the Cranex process? Uh, we have worked with a couple nursing homes in the local area. Um, and it's always, always a good idea if you're, if you have the foresight and advance notice to move closer to the Cranex organization that you've chosen to uh, sign up with just because of simple logistics, time matters. So, uh, there is a uh, request yep. to post the election numbers. Uh, I will do that uh, on the website afterwards so that everyone can see the updated uh, election numbers. Glad we're all so excited here. All right. So there's other, there's a couple other questions in the Q and A. Uh, if any of the, I'm going to ask if uh, uh, any of the other uh, panelists want to go through and uh, pick out any questions, mm -hmm. go ahead and do so. If everyone uh, will also kind of bear with me a little bit, I'm going to try to get that Q and A, uh, I mean, the video up again and see if I can share that with everyone. Should I answer a question while you're doing that? Sure, go right ahead. So I've been asked, um, sometimes people complain that cryonics should be banned because the poor people might not be able to afford it and what would my answer be well you know all innovations almost all innovations i should say start out with adoption by the more affluent for example when we had automobiles uh the people who bought them first because they were pretty with that video were the uh were the wealthy and Yes, yeah, same with the cell phone, as uh, Rudy's pointing out. Um, they used to be huge. Uh, and the advantage, I mean, there's a disadvantage and advantage. The disadvantage to the poor people is they don't get it right away. But when they get it, usually, um, of course, it's very affordable. And the kinks have been worked out. A lot of people died with the early cars, for example, and air travel, which only the affluent could afford at first. So when they worked out the mechanical kinks, and by the time the average person could afford to fly or get a car, uh, they didn't have to worry as much about them exploding or crashing. So, you know, it's, it's like everything in life, there's pros and cons. And of course, cell phones, same thing. Uh, they used to be these big, huge boxes that businessmen carried. Now, of course, there's the little flip phones. Not even, you don't even have to flip them anymore. Uh, and they get everything. So. It's always going to happen. The innovations will be first adopted by the more affluent. And then as things get to progress and, and become, uh, let's say, less dangerous and more convenient by that time, uh, the people who are less affluent will have access as well. That's the way it's always worked. We're kind of fortunate, if I could just jump in on that for a second, we're kind of fortunate, though, that in, in our case, we've been able to keep costs um, exceptionally low. Uh, they haven't mm -hmm. gone up since the beginning. Uh, and um, with the insurance that Rudy was talking about and, uh, and other things, you know, it can really be very inexpensive to have a cryonic suspension. Additionally, one thing that I always say is, you know, we've got to figure out how to do this because if we don't, the bad guys will. You know, somebody's going to figure this out. And um, I'd really like to be <laughs> the ones that do. So mm -hmm. that's a, a separate, kind of a separate topic. 
Yeah. Well, of course, you know, it's, it's the effort here is very private. So naturally, the costs are going to be less than if government was involved. And that leads me to the next question I was asked, how could the FDA kept, keep the science of the world outside the USA from progressing? And it's done just that. And part of the reason is because the FDA, uh, since 1962, has made it very difficult for a drug to get to the marketplace. Prior to 62, it took four years to get a drug from the, mar from the lab bench to the marketplace. Uh, by the end of the last century, it took 14 years. In other words, the FDA had added 10 years to the development time of drugs, and the cost of getting a drug to market wasn't just you know, three or four times what it had been before the 60s. It was eight times or 10 times, depending on which numbers you use. And it's going up exponentially every year. So when that happens, when the cost of getting the approval is so great, the money that would have gone into innovation doesn't. It goes into jumping through the regulatory hoops. And so studies have shown that at least, at least, 50% of our innovation has been lost, probably closer to 80%. And the downside of that is you have, you have diseases that don't have a cure, that might otherwise have had one if that money had been put into innovation instead of jumping through regulatory hoops. And I might mention that these regulatory hoops that came from the 1962 amendments from the Food and Drug Act actually have cost us many years of our lives. Like 15 million people have died waiting because of that extra time frame of getting a drug, a life-saving drug from the lab bench to the marketplace. And of course we've lost innovation, so we've lost even more lives there. Uh, by the time you calculate it out, the minimum is about five years. I think it's closer to 10 because the FDA has also squelched our prevention. It's really worked hard to um, downplay uh, vitamins and nutrition and change in lifestyle as the way to stay healthy. And because of that, um, you know, there's been, there's been, for example, uh, what I call the American thalidomide. I don't want to take up all the time here, but this is kind of an interesting thing. So the, the regulations were passed because of the European thalidomide problem, which didn't happen here because it wasn't approved here. But there's a B vitamin called folic acid that can prevent uh, birth defects in children. And we knew about this in the early 80s. The FDA refused to let the folic acid manufacturers advertise that to American women who had to take it, you know, before they even knew they were pregnant, probably, because it happened to happen the first month or two. So we had something like 10,000 to 25 children born needlessly with birth defects that caused them to be institutionalized or aborted. This is the type of thing that could have been easily prevented and was not because of the FDA regulations. And now there's an effort to harmonize all over the world the FDA regulations because they are the most uh, horrific in terms of time and, and money and effort. And so if that happens, the whole world will suffer. And because the innovation in the U.S. is destroyed and about 50% of that innovation happens in the U.S., that means that these drugs can't go out to other countries either. So what happens in the U.S. ripples out into the world and has created devastating consequences. If I could, th thanks Mary, if I could take it back to the cryonics questions. Let me just say, by the way, they're, they're very different. A lot of people have very different views on some of those things. And um, probably worth repeating what Dennett says, that, that Mary's views are not necessarily the views of CI, CI doesn't have views on these issues and, and people have diverse views. I see a question here though I really want to answer and that is someone asked, should they choose to prolong life or not to prolong life on advanced directives? Um, uh, I, I think it's very important to say that CI will never advocate that anybody do anything to shorten their lives. Um, you know, we want to make clear that nobody thinks cryonics is a certainty by any means. It's not guaranteed. Uh, there are so many things that can go wrong um, you may never get frozen properly. Uh, CI may go under for any one of a number of reasons over 200 years because any organization may go under. Um, you know, uh, it is not certain that the Cranach's premise is even right in terms of the ability to, uh, to repair people and restore them. And so I would never suggest to anybody that they do anything to shorten their life through normal medical means. And I certainly would not for myself. Um, as my father said, 
you know, being frozen is a terrible thing. The alternatives are worse, but, uh, you know, try to keep your life going first. I mean, we were, we're never going to suggest the contrary to you. I'm reading, reading down the questions to see if there are others. Uh, Oh, here's a question from uh, that says, in light of COVID, does that mean medical science um, is not as advanced as perceived to be? And it, it might not be the case that technology will have be sufficient in the 21st century to revive cryopreserved patients. Um, I kind of spoke to that. I mean, I would say the answer is nobody knows. On the one hand, you know, the human body is fantastically complex. And that's why, for example, um, you know, addressing cancer has, has gotten very complicated. On the other hand, the technologies of research have expanded a lot, you know, through the use of computers, through a lot of mathematical techniques, through um, work on the human genome and so on. And so uh, I, think, I think we're getting to a point where um, our tools are, exp the skill of our tools are exponentially increasing. So will this happen in the 21st century or will it take longer? I, I don't think anybody can say. Um, uh, luckily, at liquid nitrogen temperatures, uh, at the temperatures uh, that, that patients uh -huh. are preserved at, what? nothing's going to happen to you. So you don't need to be able to make a precise prediction. In that so case. I don't need this computer anymore. Can I jump in on that one as well? Um, you know, it's, it hasn't been that long that COVID has been around. And um, I, I think back to AIDS when it first came out, and it was mystifying and people were dying and nobody knew what was going on and there was never going to be a cure and there was never going to be a treatment and, and nobody really knew. And it took, I don't know, 10 years. I mean, it, it was a horrible thing, but it took, you know, maybe 10 years before there came uh, to be some greater understanding of it. And uh, I think we also have to realize that in, you know, a year or a little over a year, a little less than a year, whatever it is, that's a really short period of time to be looking at to try and gauge our, our medical efficacy and our abilities. Um, five years, 10 years, that still is, is a fairly short period of time and still will keep us well within the 21st century. So I agree with David, we don't know. Uh, but I don't know that looking at COVID is going to give us any, um, any answers there. One other question I see here is CI considering funding research to improve our vitrification solution. Yeah, CI has funded research and then the Immortalist Society, which is a 501c3 tax exempt organization, uh, has funded research, and I've I've contributed to some of that funding um, to, to try to do uh, practical research that improves our technologies and our techniques, and, and that's ongoing. And we're certainly open to doing more of that. And if other people are interested in contributing to that funding, that um, uh, you know would certainly be a great thing. And I'd be happy to talk to you about that as, as somebody who has contributed to uh, to that funding in the past. Specifically, uh, thank you, uh, um, uh, David and Connie, for donating money uh, to um, via the Chronics Institute to uh, Adam, Professor Adam Higgins at the University of Oregon um, for cryopreservation technology, uh, and in hopes that that technology will help advance what we're doing here at CI, but also with with uh, other projects. Um, that lead up to what we're doing, much in the same fashion as what Joe Kowalski was talking about with the uh, Oregon Cryo Preservation Prize. So. Uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try real quick to get that video to run. If not, we'll go right back into the Q and A. And also, I'd like to say that if we don't catch everyone's questions, uh, what I will do is uh, afterwards I can uh, we can go over and answer them uh, and put them up on the website. Uh, just for sake of uh, time allotments. There's so one question here I see that someone knows was asked four times. Um, I can answer it now, or if you want to go to the video, just to sure. keep it in mind. Should I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the question is, does CI have a relationship with a cooperative hospice near our facility? We have worked with local hospice on a number of occasions. Uh, in the case of my father's death, uh, we worked with hospice. And uh, we also, in that case, uh, you know, it's the advantage of being local. We, we did a number of things. We, um, uh, when it was clear that he was near death, and sometimes it's clear, sometimes it isn't, of course, uh, we had 24-hour um, uh, nursing for the last few days. And uh, we also let uh, the first responders 
uh, know about our situation, and they were very, um, they were they were ready to be very helpful. As it turned out, they were unnecessary because the hospice people, um, though they would not provide standby, uh, you know, I'm at the at my father's home, which I offered to pay for. Uh, you know, they were checking in regularly, and as it turned out, somebody drove up just as my father um, died, and so the we were able to begin the procedure. They were able to pronounce death, and we were able to begin the procedure within a minute of his death. Uh, and so that was ideal and to some degree lucky, but but we have worked with local local uh, institutions, and of course, the fact that CI is right there, um, as Dennis mentioned, is very helpful. So there are advantages to being local. We're not suggesting that people uproot their lives and move to Detroit, but um, but there are certainly advantages if you are here. David, could I ask related to that question? Because this this is nuance was made clear to me not too long ago, and I realized that I maybe had been um, providing some information that might not have been current. Is there a physical hospital hospital hospice that people can go to without renting a house or something? Can they physically go to a physical hospice facility near CI? Uh, I'm not aware of one. I mean, typically hospice is a service that's provided to people, uh, whether they're low, whether they're in the hospital or at home. Uh, I, I can step on, on that though. Uh, there is a hospice, uh, several of them close by that members have used and we've had success with. You'd have to talk to uh, Andy about that. So Andy has information on the hospices and the names of them that we have used. So it, it is correct for me to say that there are hospices near CI that if you're terminal, you should get to their ASAP while you're alive, go to that physical hospice, and that's the best thing for you to do to get a good crowd. Well, ho hospice care can actually be in your home as well. I think that's what David was saying. It's a designation. So you could be in a yes. home close by, or you could be in a facility. Yeah. Okay. And we're not saying, you know, this is something some, some people should definitely do, or they should definitely go there, but it's something worth looking into if um, if you're interested in in, uh, in in uprooting yourself. And of course, not everybody knows when they're going to die. You know, it's not it's not that simple in many cases. All right, now if people will bear with me, I'm gonna try to get that video working. <laughs> Complete with sound uh, this time. Yeah, well, we're gonna now see. Now new and approved with sound. We're gonna have right, talking. right, here we go. Let's see what hey. happens. I hear crickets by you, Joe. Yeah, yep, we do have crickets. You, I'll mute uh, it. Hey, uh, Joe, Joe, you got all our beer getting ready for uh, uh, cold and our marshmallows for the after party. That, that's what you, you, you bring the beer, Rudy. I just have the marshmallows. Right. Can I have a lot of sugar? All right. Uh, let me let me know at least with a thumbs up if uh, if this video works, everyone. The fascinating science of cryonics. Oh yeah. A second chance at life. The whole idea of cryonics started with physics professor Robert Edinger. He pioneered the movement with his seminal book, The Prospect for Immortality. immortality. He then went on to launch the Cryonics Institute. But just what is cryonics, and what does the Cryonics Institute do? Cryonics is a procedure that preserves the human body at low temperatures after death, in the hope it can be revived in the future. The process should begin immediately after a person is declared legally dead. Even though the heart has stopped beating, there's still brain function during this period, so a heart-lung resuscitator is used to stabilize the body and keep the brain supplied with blood and oxygen. The body is cooled in an ice bath to slow down metabolic demand and to protect both DNA and organ structure. Then anticoagulants and protective medications are injected into the body to stop the blood clotting during transit. The body is then packed in ice and transported to a cryonics facility. Once there, a process called vitrification begins where the blood is replaced with a cryoprotectant antifreeze solution. This is done to prevent the cells from freezing and to stop ice crystals from forming around organs at extremely low temperatures. The body is then placed in a computerized vapor cooling chamber and cooled to negative 196 degrees Celsius. Once the body is properly cooled, the patient is transferred to a long-term cryostat storage container. Thousands of people are signed up for cryonics throughout the world, and the numbers are steadily growing.
The Cryonics Institute is the world's largest provider of whole body cryonics. They have performed more whole body human and pet cryo suspensions than any other organization. The Cryonics Institute is also the most affordable cryonics company with a whole body suspension fee of only $28,000. Most people can afford this cost with simple life insurance. Our organization is a member-owned nonprofit with open financial records. Suspension money collected is carefully invested in secure endowment-like securities. The investment dividends earned from these investments fund perpetual storage and cryonics upkeep. This is how CI has operated since 1976. Some people prematurely dismiss cryonics because the technology to revive someone who has been cryogenically frozen does not exist yet. But they miss the point. Cryonics is really an ambulance ride now to a future hospital where that technology may someday exist. What does science say? There are now peer-reviewed scientific papers supporting cryonics, as well as many PhDs who have gone on record to support cryonics. Recent advances in stem cells, nanotechnology, and genetic engineering are proving that what was once considered impossible is becoming routine. Some have suggested that someday even aging itself may be halted or reversed. People once considered dead only 50 years ago, today are revived with CPR and cardiac defibrillation. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation and organ transplant technology were once shunned by primitive thinkers, but today they are hailed as life-saving advances. If history has taught us anything, no one knows the future, and it is foolish to say what future technology will be impossible. Considering the alternative, which is certain death, Cryonics is a rational scientific wager with little to lose and virtually everything to gain. Check out cryonics.org to learn more. All right. That is a great video, Dennis. Bravo. Really beautifully done. Thank you, Rudy. Um, I mean, I'm kind of, well, I'm sure and even more here. Um, but anyways, uh, we're kind of preaching to the choir a little bit when it comes to uh, uh, all that information, but not everyone who's uh, joining us, this is open to the public, uh, knows everything about the cryonics. So uh, this is kind of a nice little uh, uh, interview or introduction to the process. So now if I can just get out of this screen. Are you gonna go through all the questions, Dennis, like from top to bottom, or do you want us to just respond to them? Uh, actually, I was going to wrap up with, I wanted to show also um, the uh, tour of CI. Can you see, can you see that? No, you're going to have to share that. All right, I have to share one more thing here. Hey, we have all hung tough on these in, in this tough time. I'm proud of all of us for working through these tech glitches and say, yeah. staying tough. Good work for everybody. I appreciate your patience. I hope everyone else is just as patient out there. Oh, well, I didn't say I was that patient. I didn't say I was patient. I just oh, mean, okay, okay. Where I get death. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to come back to that. We can go back into the Q and A for a little bit. Is Andy Zawaki in the call? Uh, I am not sure. He's not on as a panelist, uh, so he might be on as an attendee. He's following, he's following you. He's following he is following it. Okay, that's cool. okay. Hi, Andy. Just wanted to tell you, appreciate your important hard work, man. You're amazing. Um, if any of the panelists want to go through any of the Q and A and uh, pick up on an answer, uh, go right ahead. I can uh, go through with uh, another subject, and that is uh, future capital purchases. Uh, when I did my analysis of the last five and a half years of capital expenditures, the annual average came out a little under $140,000. Uh, in 2017, CI purchased its second building and is right now retrofitting it to uh, serve. One of the requirements will be to uh, establish a bulk storage liquid nitrogen tank. Uh, the current or the original CI building 
had one installed 18 years ago at a cost of $65,000. Uh, the idea is to move that tank to the second building, which is a little smaller, and then install a new larger tank on the original building. So in the next year, there's a good chance that cost will be significantly over $100,000. Uh, and then there's going to be other costs of rehabilitating the building, such as uh, fireproofing. And uh, I'm not sure if there's a sprinkler system in there yet, but uh, CI has the funds to pay for it. Uh, it uh, comes out of, it's part of what the membership dues pay for uh, and uh, the bequests pay for. So that is a second container for additional LO2, uh, liquid nitrogen, is that correct, Pat? Right, there'll be one at each building. The original building has a larger storage capacity, so that's where we want to have the larger tank. Pat, also, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's relevant, but if you still wanted to pull up your slides, you might be able to do that now. Uh, don't need to do that. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Dennis, I'm going to need to get going. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ruert. Thank you, Mary. Appreciate yeah. you being here. Take care. Yep. Yep. Great connecting again. Thank you all. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. One other question, Dennis, that came up quite a bit. People are, are talking back and forth about neuros. And I guess without going into great detail, I would say it's an issue that's been talked about over many years, many times at CI. And the conclusion is that uh, we just don't think it's a good idea to offer neuros. Um, we think there are, it, you know, the science is debatable. The public relations we think is, is terrible. And uh, given that a whole body suspension at CI is so affordable, we don't see the need. Yeah, I think in the questions, uh, they said, would it ever be possible? We never say never, but it's unlikely to change. Uh, anyone else wanted to handle or field any more questions? Otherwise, uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to the Immortalist Society. So you need a motion to adjourn, Dennis? Yes. So move. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, Debbie, uh, I want to go ahead and ask her to unmute herself. So you want to take a vote? Uh, Hard to do, but uh, yeah, yeah. Does anybody object to adjournment of the meeting? <laughs> no, all in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Debbie, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello, Debbie. So Debbie is a Cranix Institute director, and she is also here today to represent the Immortal Society for President York Porter. And uh, this concludes the Cranix Institute meeting. Uh, like I said before, what we will do is we'll put up uh, any further questions on the website. And I'm also going to put up a slideshow on the website for anyone who wants to take a quick tour of the building. Uh, you know, usually uh, it's been practiced practice that uh, everyone would show up to the CI building, check out everything that we've done, and and then they'd uh, move over to the conference hall because the meetings have gotten so big now. Uh, unfortunately, because of the COVID, we're not able to do that and hang out, but we thought it'd be a good idea to take pictures so that everyone can see exactly how the building looks in its with its latest improvements. But uh, welcome, Debbie, and... Uh, uh, that concludes the CI meeting. Uh, welcome to uh, Mortal Society. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for everybody, to everybody that's still here listening. Uh, I want to congratulate all of my fellow directors for the being reinstated. Um, I'm here, I'm Debbie Fleming. I'm the Vice President of the Immortalist Society. I'm here for York who had work obligations and we're sorry that he's not here. Um, I'm joined by other officers. Royce Brown is a longtime secretary and Leonie Blaney is our treasurer. Stefan Beauregard serves as a board member at large. 
Just a brief review for those of you who are not familiar with the Immortalist Society. The Immortalist Society and Chronics Institute are two entirely separate organizations that try to cooperate to whatever degree they can in the field of cryonics. CI engages in providing actual cryonic services, among other things, and IS concentrates on research and education. IS goes back to the old days as the Cryonic Society of Michigan way back in the 1960s. Then it changed its name to the Cryonics Association. And then it had another name change to the Immortalist Society, in part to correspond with Robert Ettinger's seminal work, The Prospect of Immortality. IS does research through contract with the research company known as Advanced Neural Biosciences. And IS also engages in education through the publication of Long Life magazine. It further provides educational and research information through a website that can be viewed at immortalistsociety.org and immortalistsociety.com. We encourage you to check those sites out or that site. And we have our uh, Long Life magazine archives and the current edition there if you'd like to read it. We'd also like to thank the folks who contribute in whatever amount, large or small, to the IS research effort. Your support has been essential in keeping the IS research program going. We further sponsor the Cryo Prize that has as its goal the furthering of interest in organ cryopreservation. Joe Kowalski is the person chairing this effort and we thank Joe very much for his efforts as well as his presentation earlier. The ultimate cryo prize goal is $100,000 and we are at the moment at a level of $3,629.61 in the cryo prize fund. You can check the cryo prize out further by going to cryoprize.com. Back to research, hopefully by the next meeting, a representative of A and B will be available at the meeting to discuss the research program in depth. In the meantime, Long Life will in the next issue or so provide information about the ongoing research program that has been conducting as a joint effort with the American Cryonics Society. We'd also like to thank ACS very much for its financial backing and helping to provide free copies of Long Life to numerous readers. Understandably, that backing is going to, it won't last forever, but it's been wonderful to have them, their assistance in helping us spread the word of the great field of cryonics. Due to the COVID virus meeting format that we have this year, we're going to do just an abbreviated financial report for members, and then we'll move on to the officer's election, and that will pretty much be it for this year. Hopefully by next year, things will be different and we could see each other. The Immortalist Society presently has $21,471.22 in the bank. We also have solidly expected revenue coming in from LEF for the LEF ads and a donation from ACS. Those totals will be $7,159.98. This gives a grand total of $28,631.20 in IS financial resources that may be divided into funds available for research of $15,727.68. Funds for CryoPrize, as mentioned earlier, $3,629.61 and $9,273.91 left over for general operations. Now this is normally the time when we do our election of officers, but due to this situation of having to use Zoom, we're not able to take any nominations from the floor and have a vote in the usual fashion. Because of that, since we have not received anything from anyone wanting to run prior to the meeting, the present officers will then serve another term that will end on December 31st, 2021. If someone still wishes to make a nomination of an IS voting member for any office, however, you can send it to us by email in the next seven days. If that occurs, we will have to have an election done by mail ballot or through email or other electronic means between now and the first of the year when the present officer's terms will end. Please remember this nomination process is only for Immortalist Society members. 
If you are not already a member, you're not eligible to participate. Well, that's it for this meeting. Thank you for everybody that's still here listening. Um, hopefully we can have a regular meeting next year and see each other in person. Please stay safe out there. And uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Where's Dennis? He done? I think I hear him. Hello. He'll be down Hi. in a minute. Hi, Debbie. He <laughs> <laughs> was absent without leave, I believe. <laughs> hey, I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Anyways, uh, is that, are you done then, Debbie? I'm sorry. We are done. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much, and uh, I appreciate everyone and uh, every, every, uh, everything that everyone's doing. I can't say it enough. Um, there's, like I said, I'm going to answer those questions as we go later on, and we'll be able to, uh, you know what, I'm going to try, just to, for the heck of it. I want to try to show that slide. So. All right. I mean, this is kind of like the less formal. Uh, are there, are there we'll still any happens. real live people out there besides us chickens? I, I yeah, yeah. I all I hear is crickets. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's <laughs> Sorry, that's from my house. I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put this, it on mute again. This is like the extra bonus feature at the end of the movie where you. That's can, right. You can feel, free, the, you can feel they, free to leave and turn it off if you want. They, to, right? Yeah, right. all the all the unscripted and slightly not appropriate uh, things occur. <laughs> oh no! In ten minutes, I'm gonna stuff my mouth with marshmallows. But well, that's what uh, I don't have to do. To stuff them for us as well. Uh, uh, can anyone see what I'm looking at here? Oh yeah, I see. There's a slide. Oh yeah. Oh hey, what do you know? You got uh, it. We are masters yep. of technology. Can you guys really hear the crickets? Yep. Oh wow! All right, yeah. I'll mute. No, I like the crickets. Kind of. All right, then I'll leave it on. Gives me kind of a nature feel background crickets <clears throat> not everybody may like them you may want to, you may want to mute. <laughs> hey, there, there's some advantage okay, having losing your high frequency hearing i can't hear them at all <laughs> that's perfect dennis you got it okay uh here's the front of the building uh it is slightly different uh i think andy removed that uh, arborvitae bush off to the left uh, <laughs> and put some different plants in there but uh, that's pretty close to what the front of the building looks like I think we got rid of those weeds too. You know what, Dennis? Maybe maybe you should mention who the two people are who are named on the building because they're you know pretty prominent in our history. Uh, actually, David uh, would probably know. A little bit more. Yeah, I, I was curious about that. Erford Runkel. Yeah, Jack. As I mentioned, I think Jack Erford and Walter Runkel were two of the founders, original members of CI. In fact, the original perfusion machine we used was designed by Walt Runkel, who was an engineer. Um, and Jack was a research scientist at the University of Michigan, um, and they are both uh, preserved at the facility. And Walter Uncle's daughter spoke last year at the meeting, right? Yeah. Yep. And they're both they were both officers of the organization in, in its early days. Oh, she she was a fantastic speaker. And and actually, Jack Erford's wife, Andrea Foote, was our president at one time as well. Right. And she's great. also. She, she, she and Jack both died, unfortunately, in their 50s, um, but they are preserved at CI. I'm sorry, we don't hear you, Dennis. Can you hear me now? Barely. We hear the crickets, but not Dennis. Sorry. Is, is your propeller working, Dennis? Give us a count. Can you hear us? Speak. Can you share it? Yeah. yeah. Dennis, maybe we wrap it up now for those who have been okay, patient enough to stay. I can't even hear David. I lost him.
I'm waiting for the boss to tell me I can go. Yeah. <laughs> is that Dennis? Is that you, Dennis? <laughs> <laughs> sounds like we could hear you through a microphone, maybe on the computer itself. I don't know. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. 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 All right. Sorry about that. I got it now. Damn technology. <laughs> All right. If it makes, makes you feel any better, I've done lots and lots of Zoom calls um, in the last few months, and every in every single call, somebody has a problem. So, yeah. yeah, I'm always annoyed with people who have a problem until I find that it's me. And then I thought, oh, my goodness, I should not be so judgmental. I saw Our Connie Benger do a show. She's a comedian, you know, and, and her the beginning of everything went wrong. And it was the best show I've ever seen. I was so nervous for the first two minutes. And then, wow. All right. Well, let me get back to possibly working on this slideshow here. We were talking about... Uh, uh, the Runkel Irk, Irk Fund, Runkel Building, uh, was, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, did they not donate money um, to the uh, actual establishment of this building? Well, all of CI's early founding members made substantial bequests to the organization um, so that uh, they paid considerably more than the minimum. Uh, that's not why the building was named for them. It was named for them because of because of their efforts, But but that's certainly true. Okay. Okay. Uh, next slide is of some uh, pictures that we have. There we go. Can you see this? Oh, no. Sorry about that. Got to go back to Zoom here and share the screen. Turn off, turn off this. Click that off. All right. All right. Uh, can you see this? Thumbs up. Yep. Okay. So these pictures are in the hallway. Uh, the Arthur C. Clarke's uh, laws. Um, definitely our motto. One of our mottos. Uh, this is our um, conference room. I don't know if everyone has seen this. Uh, conference room and it also doubles as uh, kind of a tribute memorial room because on the screen we show pictures of all the patients that have been uh, cryo preserved before us and uh, it's going to be a nice place for people to come in and grieve and uh, or at least you know um, consider the their hopeful wishes for the future and this is where we can conduct business as well. This is actually the uh, cryopreservation perfusion room where the patient's body would be laid out here. And this is a perfusion machine that acts like a, almost like a cardiac bypass machine, pumps in the fluids of cryopreservation. You can see one of the cryostats off to the side. This is a slightly older picture. You can see it's an older floor in the future pictures. You'll see that we've actually upgraded the floors <clears throat> this is the uh, from, uh, from the other angle, the preservation room. Uh, this here is the computerized uh, cooling cooling box. So uh, basically, uh, liquid nitrogen vapor runs through this uh, hose right here, and comes down here, runs through this hose, and the patient's slowly cooled over a period of about three days to reduce uh, thermal cracking. So. Another protection, you can see the new floors that have been put into place. Just another angle. Uh, this is one of the original cryostats, uh, holds, I believe, 14 people. This was uh, fabricated by Andy Zawaki, basically hand built. Uh, excellent, excellent cryostat, just very labor intensive to build this. Uh, this is a more updated picture. You can see we've got the lights installed. We've got the new flooring, uh, the new catwalks, uh, safety rails, and so forth for refilling and checking the crowd stats. Again, from another angle. Uh, 
Uh, this is the back end, um, the other side of the facility. We've already started a whole new row. If you can see down at the far end, we've got a uh, experimental cryostat that we're running with. This is uh, kind of a elevated view of the same cryostats. From the top, uh, these would be where the fill ports are and the inspection ports to uh, see how much liquid nitrogen is in there. Everything is physically measured. We don't rely on electrical or mechanical systems. This is done uh, basically, each one has to be dipped every single day and that's how we've done it since 1976, no incidents. So unless someone's not doing their job, unless the person isn't physically measuring these, there's nothing that can me mechanically fail. You know, I think that's really important, Dennis, that a lot of people think that it's important to have a lot of uh, technology involved and things like that. But sometimes the more technology you have, the more possibility there is for something to fail, as you just said. Sometimes simpler is better, you know. Yeah, um, exactly. I if mean, it works and it does what we need it to do, as long as it does what we need it to do. Right. There, there's an old, uh, I don't know if it's true, uh, kind of a, a joke fairy tale type of, but it, it I forget where it started this uh uh, there was a, I forget, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, there was, um, uh, um, while you're thinking about that, I, I would add that even if somebody were to make an error, uh, the cryostats are checked often enough and that, that even if there were some boil off, uh, you know, it wouldn't have any impact for many, many days. So for there to be a problem, somebody, there would have to be repeated and so systematic errors over a long period of time for there, there to be any risks here, and that's never going to happen. Oh, yeah. Day after day, someone would have to not purposely not measure these cryostats. So, and we, we do have some alarm systems if the amount of liquid nitrogen in the atmosphere should go up, uh, fans kick in, you know, to make it a safe environment for the employees that are working there. It's not that liquid nitrogen is a poisonous gas, but it does displace oxygen. Uh, but what I was trying to say is um, uh, there was a saying out there that uh, NASA spent millions of dollars uh, to develop a ballpoint pen in space that would write in upside down and in zero gravity. And the Russians do, in their space program just said to heck with it and use pencils and it worked just fine. Uh, it turns out, I don't think that was true, but it just kind of illustrates the point. Sometimes simpler is better and it works. Here's uh, the bulk liquid nitrogen tank at the back of the facility. Um, this uh, saved us a lot of money. We used to get them, uh, the liquid nitrogen shipped in uh, smaller containers. And whenever you buy liquid nitrogen in bulk, you save a lot of money. Yeah, and, cut uh, the cost in half and uh, the cost of it, 65000 was paid off within three years through lower cryogen costs. Uh, that tank holds 3,000 gallons. I believe Andy said that it needs to be refilled about every three weeks, which is why we want to get a larger tank for the original building, a 5,000 tank that would last over a month uh, if necessary. I think it was your ideal, wasn't it, Pat, to get the bulk liquid nitrogen tank in the first place? It was. Yep, thank you. <laughs> that certainly has saved us a lot of money and headaches over the years. Two, two things might be worth mentioning in connection with that. One is, that, you know, when, when the original cost, the original $28,000 price was set, it was based on an estimated cost of maintenance, which is basically replenishing liquid nitrogen, that was much higher than our current cost. And that's why we've been able to keep the price stable, because yeah. we've reduced liquid nitrogen costs dramatically. Um, the second point I would raise is just to show you that uh, CI is worrying about these things. Early on in the COVID crisis, we were concerned that there was a possibility that with shutdowns that we might not obtain deliveries of liquid nitrogen. That turned out not to be a problem at all, but for some period of time, we got them more frequently uh, just to make sure we had a complete full tank at all times, just in case there was some interruption. And as I said, there, there wasn't, but uh, you know, people at CI are worrying about all the same things that the questioners are worried about uh, on a real-time basis. Yeah, the original budget for liquid nitrogen was $1,000 per human per year. 
the actual costs in the last several years is in the 300 to $350 per human patient per year. And that pretty much, that concludes the slideshow. That's all the new stuff that uh, was uh, installed in the building. Um, and that also concludes the whole meeting for that matter. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for- uh, It ain't so. Yeah. Well, you can stay on if you want. I'm, I'm going to yeah. sign off, but you can stay on as long All as you right. like. All right. Let's move to adjourn, <laughs> key, key people. Okay. Thank you, yeah, boss. Can I, can I add one more thing? Um, you know, when we do this in person, the one advantage is people can come up and chat with individuals after the meeting. And of course, we can't do that here. But, you know, if you do have an interest in talking to somebody in particular about some issue, um, you know, send a CI an email and we'll get back to you. Please. Perfect. Please do. Uh, do many good if, if you go to the website, uh, all the directors have right by their names, they have their, uh, their contact information and Rudy Hoffman, I believe has his own website. So he's easy to contact and get a hold of. And uh, if you cannot find me, you do not deserve to be crowd preserved. You're just, you're just too dumb. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, everyone, you take care. Hey See Dennis, ya. thank you everybody. Bye bye. Right, everybody. Everybody. A big, a big virtual hug to all you folks uh, throughout yep. the world. For sure. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Take care. everyone, for your patience. Uh, let's see. How, how do I end this? I'm staying. <laughs> I'm set, I'm shutting you down. I, I got my my thing going here. We're gonna we're gonna have a little.